Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Juan, for the nice introduction. My name is Peter Doge. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Paul, and the whole staff for the nice invitation. It's really a privilege to learn for, from uh, shared decision making. I hope we can share the decisions on the ankle also after this talk. Um, so I'm a lower limb arthroscopist mainly, uh, with focus on uh, ankle. And uh, I had the opportunity to talk to you about a specific ankle pathology, which is called the syndesmosis. So, difficult word, but uh, where are the Greeks in the room? Oh, there they are. So, what is syndesmosis? It must be Greek, right? What does it mean, Vasilis? So it is. So, it, of course, I did my research. So, uh, so apparently, it uh, it means to join joints, eh? to to use a ligament to join joints. So that's where the syndesmosis comes in. Now, um, when we have the question of talking, we had a specific question saying, when do you refer for surgery? And we as surgeons, we like simple things. So it's nice to just talk about our idea and our indication setting, how to address a syndesmotic injury, whether you go for surgery or not. And I'm happy to tell you how we at Aspetar here do it like that. I have no disclosures, and I would like to start with a little video. Look at the number four here, his right ankle. Now, what do you see? You're on the bench, and this is a Wolverhampton uh, Premier League uh, uh, gameplay, where you have a deceleration, a dorsiflexion, and an external rotation. If you're a doctor on the bench, you know what he has. So that's simple. Eh? So how does the syndesmosis look like? A quick roundup on the anatomy. You have the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. You have something in between the tibia and the fibula called the interosseous ligament. And you have one on the back. So from the front in the middle to the back, you have a nice stabilizer of ligaments to join the distal part of that tibiofibular area that it doesn't open. As I said, I like to keep it simple. What do we do? We look, we listen, and we feel. Three things that are very helpful in order to guide yourself whether you go for surgery or not. We listen. Sometimes you're on the bench and you see it yourself. But what does the player say? Did he have a kick? It can be a fracture, cuboid on the lateral side, a fibular, a distal fibula, or whatever. Does he present with an alignment with cavus? If he twisted there, it might be a metatarsal 5 that mimics lateral pain, a problem with ligaments. What about an inversion? Was it inversion, as he says, or was it plantar or dorsiflexion and external rotation? Just simple things that guide you a big time way onto the diagnosis itself without having any imaging. We look, we have special imaging, X-ray, ultrasound, MRI, I'll go to, you, to that in a minute. But we can identify the clear spaces. Is it opening or not? Now, it's not that easy, but at least it supports us in our, in our algorithm towards a solution. And of course, we feel, we do provocative tests in order to know, is this an unstable joint itself or not? Now, you will say, I don't care. With ankles, sprains, they heal anyway, which is true. But this is not an ankle sprain. A syndesmosis is called a high ankle sprain, but it's a totally different mechanism because it involves the ankle from the ankle all the way up to the proximal tibia. And that's why we call it mainly a ligament injury where there happens to be also fractures. It's very different and I can tell you that indeed I would agree that most all ankle sprains they heal, but not most all ankle uh, syndesmotic sprains heal. So that's what we want to identify. What are the provocative tests? I, mentioned them here, but I thought that's too theoretic. So yesterday I asked my daughters to uh, be a, a, a kind of demo and to show you the tests. This is the squeeze test. Now to tell you, there's no patognomonic clinical test to say whether it's unstable or not. But as I said, it guides you in the process of look, listen and feel. This is the squeeze test. Then you have the external rotation test. You stabilize the medial part of your tibia and you go in external rotation. And if there's an apprehension there, you have a positive test. Of course, my other daughter was jealous, so she wanted her foot also on the video. So there we are with the fibular translation test. And the fourth provocative test is the cotton test. It's a kind of medial subtalar glide where you identify the instability that might be there. And of course, don't mix with uh, kind of hyperlaxity, uh, you have the other side to compare. 
Last test is the cross leg test. And that's where you use the medial uh, side of the knee in order to provocatively induce pain over that distal syndesmotic area. These are the tests. Look, listen, feel. Even more simple. There's three grades, so it's all three. Grade one, grade two, grade three. So clinically, by just looking and listening, you can identify already your algorithm itself. Grade one, simple. There's not too much pain. The radiographs are normal. And the lateral ligaments are painful, but not unstable on clinical testing. Simple, never surgery. You do your algorithm of physio and rehabilitation and, and strapping. That works very well. That is validated and well used uh, with our uh, department. And you can have a grade three where you have a complete mess up from the medial side deltoid all the way over that cartilage to the distal side and uh, the posterolateral and anterolateral side of ligament issue. So, grade three, always surgery. You hear me coming. Grade two, how many percent of all non-fracture, athletic-induced injuries are grade two in syndesmosis? Hit me. Two thirds. Two thirds. We're very close. 89%. So, it's very easy, right? Grade one, never. Grade three, always. We got there. But the problem is, it's always a mess up. Because maybe. So maybe, what is that? If you go to an aggressive surgeon, you'll have a surgery. If you go to somebody who believes in conservative therapy, you'll have conservative therapy. But what are the guidelines? What do, how do we do it evidence-based? There we go. Clinically, you have a partial ligament disruption, you have normal radiographs, but your tests, who are not pathognomonic, but identify whether it's poss possibly unstable or not, are positive, mainly squeeze and external rotation. Again, this was a case last night. We had the, the privilege of doing some night surgery on a typical syndesmotic case, so uh, I, guess, I guess it's the week of syndesmosis. You have a complete deltoid rupture. You have all the way cartilage damage. You have a full open syndesmosis. And as you know, eh, this is a, a pronation injury, external rotation, so it goes all the way to the back and has the fracture here. What do you do? You put a plate on it, you reduce it in the syndesmosis, and you heal the deltoid with sutures and anchors, and that's how surgically we do that. But as I said, this is maybe 5 or 6% of the cases that you have. What is the algorithm in the literature? When you look at the literature, at, at the systematic reviews, they say if it's a fracture, orthopedic control. If it's stable grade 1, we go to functional rehab. If it's unstable grade 3, we go to surgery. So again, it sounds simple, but most of the cases are grade two. How do we know whether it's stable or unstable? We can look, we can feel, we can do x-ray, but none of the three have the clear validated um, challenge of saying it's unstable or stable. The only pathognomonic test that we have to know if it's unstable is surgery. You do arthroscopy, you open it, and you know. But if you're gonna do surgery on every athlete who has grade two, you're going to operate way too much of them without really necessary, uh, without having it necessary. So we're still not there. Let's go back to literature. They should help us, right? We have a systematic review in Gizakos of a few weeks ago. Appropriate management of syndesmotic injuries enables athletes to return to play. I agree with that. Currently, there's no best evidence based. So of the grade twos, we are talking about the grade twos. So, currently, we are unable to adequately differentiate between stable and unstable grade twos. That's not really helpful, right? So, when we go more in-depth on the surgical literature on it, my friend James Calder and his team did wonderful work on that in the UK, and they identified in a prospective comparative study recently, uh, about one year ago, that when you have a positive squeeze test, an injury to the ATFL on your imaging, and deltoid ligament injury, whether it's deep or superficial, they don't really know. Well, that can help you. So, let's go. You have a grade two, you have a positive squeeze test, and there's some injury on ATFL and deltoid. For the moment, that's what we know to say go for surgery. All the rest, we don't know. So, we went to literature, but how is Aspetar? How do we do? Now, again, syndesmosis is not so easy to treat, but look, we did uh, our team. In the last five years, we did 203 cases and reached 141 of people, and we did a telephone questionnaire. I know it's not uh, the level one evidence, but still, it guides us through. 
still 98% are athletes. The return to play is about two months, two months and a half. The same level is reached, no new surgery needed, and other issues, not really, and they evaluate their result. So although the literature is not really helping us, we're doing quite well. Why is that? That is because we all came here because Aspetar has a specific niche pathology while we put everything together. And I know it sounds cliche, but we have our colleagues and friends from NSMP, National Sports Medicine Program, who show us the video, what happened. We have a good train between sports med and orthopedics to diagnose well in collaboration with the, uh, the radiology. We have podiatrists and we have, of course, the physiotherapy department that all works together. And that's why we get these results, because we all share this decision making and we try to do the best for our athlete. Imaging helps us. MRI is the best, especially to identify the ligaments. But ultrasound, there's still a, a wide range, and I know in USA it's not so commonly used, but we think, and we're trying to validate with our uh, friends of radiology, that ultrasound can really benefit in the early assessment of stability, yeah, because it's a dynamic test. Again, I, I told you that arthroscopy is, at this stage, the only tool to know whether it's unstable. How does it look like? This is a very mild, partial grade one. This is a grade one to two. There's some stretch, partial tear. Again, sorry, this is the tibia. This is uh, the talus. So you have the tibial plafond here and the talus. We're looking at the anterolateral side of the ankle. But this doesn't look good, right? This is a grade uh, two to three rupture of the AITFL. And sometimes even the IOL, the introseous ligament, falls from above down into the joint. And that's the worst. So it looks like that. What do we do with arthroscopy? We put a big shaver, like a tool inside, 4.5, 5.5-D meter. If we can push the B all the way into the joint, as I said, surgeons like to keep it simple. It's simple. If the B goes in, it's unstable. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do we use also? The shaver test, the external rotation test, but the hook test. This is, in literature, the only test that is validated to say whether it's unstable. You take a hook, you pull on it, and if it opens, it's unstable. Okay? All right. It's really true, by the way. Uh, how can we improve? Now, I'm happy uh, to show this, and I'm not the guy dealing with this at uh, the, the senior level, so I'm not the representative, but I want to show you how we can improve. Uh, we know now how to deal with the unstable ones, I've showed you, but there's so much stable ones, and gr thanks to the team of uh, Rod, of Omar al Sayrafi, uh, sports medicine and, and radiology and podiatry and surgery, everybody together, we now just got the approval to make a study, especially with Hans Stoll, who is our visiting uh, sports medicine specialist, uh, together with Omar, to identify what is the outcome of the, uns uh, of the stable syndesmotic ligament uh, problem. So this is the questionnaire, please. Uh, I think it's a good message for everybody who's here and, and the time to say, if you have an acute ankle sprain, please call us and we'll start the questionnaire there and then we don't lose any uh, pathology in our review to know how it's going to be with our athletes. So, we're getting there. How can we improve? We're doing the questionnaires, we're following up, up prospectively and we also developed together with Slim, I'm sure he's here, yeah, somewhere, thank you Slim, uh, the tool that his, his and our department have been working on uh, thoroughly about how to identify unstable tears. You fix the knee so it doesn't rotate, you go in plantar, dorsi and neutral flexion and you push towards the exterior part. So you try to simulate that external rotation. We know from cadaveric studies that the syndesmosis opens between 87 and 100 newton. So how does it look like? This is my foot, but this is slim and he's pushing my foot in external rotation. And we're trying to find out that if you have apprehension before 87 Newton, you should have an unstable joint. It's not validated yet, but hopefully it's a good idea and we can use it as a useful tool. Uh, of course, please don't let me forget the functional rehab who has amazing potential in the conservative therapy and postoperative therapy of syndesmotic injuries. And my last slides would be that whether you use a screw, whether you use a tightrope suture button, uh, it's all good, just make sure you get it stable. Why? Because we recently had a, a patient treated elsewhere who had a malleolar fracture and a fibular fracture, a supination adduction injury. Um, what happened? The screw broke, so there's still too much mobility here. 
not really good um, attenuation of the articular joint. And what happens then? They remove the screws because it was broken. Still no good, and the syndesmosis opens. I've always learned in uh, our humble house in Belgium, Socrates, our father in medicine, said primum non nocere, which means, by all means, do not harm. So this is the team doctor, and it's not a good idea to do that. Allow me to thank you again, and, uh, and you can all find it in the books and the diplomas that we make. <laughs>